welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's so great to see this crowd. So I, I see some familiar faces, but also some new faces, which I'm excited about. Um, I want to thank you for joining us for our series dedicated to the historic neighborhood of San Juan Hill. And for those of you who don't know, this series is part of a larger initiative called Legacies of San Juan Hill, which is dedicated to exploring and uplifting the history, communities, and cultural legacy of the neighborhood that once existed in the area where Lincoln Center resides today. So this neighborhood, in and around this neighborhood. Um, tonight's conversation, as you know, will explore the life and musical legacy of James Reese Europe, pictured right there, excuse me, uh, composer and band leader and um, just an influential musician who lived, who worked in this area a uh, hundred years ago, roughly, in the early 20th century. And without further ado, I'm very pleased to uh, invite our panelists and our moderator up to the stage, and I will introduce them now. So first, uh, please welcome our first panelist, a drummer, activist, band leader, and historian, Jerome Jennings. Our next panelist is an associate professor of history and African and African American studies at Duke University, Adrian Lent Smith. Also joining us is curator of music and performing arts at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, Stephen Lewis. And last but not least, please welcome our moderator and the curator of this event, a saxophonist and conductor, as well as founding director and senior scholar of the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, Lauren Schoenberg. Thank you. Thank you all for coming for this very special event. And I think it's so important to recognize how Lincoln Center is really making good on their long-term proposal to keep this project going about where we are, where we're sitting, what we're looking at right now. And uh, this is part of an incredible long-range series. And I'm just so proud to be part of it, and especially to be on the stage with these folks. Uh, real quick, you're going to hear some music. You're going to hear some live music by an incredible young musician to make the point that James Reese Europe's legacy is not something that is only kind of like backward looking, but that it actually is going to carry on well into the next century and way beyond. Before we get to the music, I just want to mention one thing. I remember reading early on, maybe 50 years ago or something, when I was starting to get into James Reese Europe, and it said something like, well, James Reese Europe was the first Duke Ellington. And that's how I thought for a long time. And then I began to think, well, maybe Duke Ellington was the second James Reese Europe. <laughs> and I actually do think so. But that's a long story that we're going to get into today with our distinguished panelists. But let's begin by actually listening to James Reese Europe. This is Jada. <laughs> now, you're... To bring it into the year 2024, I want to introduce to you a wonderful young pianist who's currently finishing up his studies at the Juilliard School. He's already playing internationally, and you're going to hear about him if you haven't already. His name is Esteban Castro and Jada. <laughs> 
Esteban Castro. He'll be back. So as we get into the story of James Weiss Europe, as much as we can in a short amount of time, I'd like to introduce Adrian here, who is going to uh, talk about the early years and about how uh, James Weiss Europe, uh, where he came from and how it started and how music came into his life. And we'll start our jam session right now. I was just thinking about um, showing my kids the jerk. So there's part of me that wants to be like, he was born a poor black child. <laughs> Um, but he actually, that would be uh, actually a little bit incorrect. So James Reese Europe was born um, in the 1880s, or some things I've read say 80, 81, or 82, in Mobile, Alabama. Um, his mother was a woman who'd been born free, Lorraine Saxon. His father had been born enslaved, um, Henry, I think, Jefferson Europe. And he was the fourth of five children. They lived in Mobile for a time, then they moved to D.C. in 1890 or so, where he came of age until his father passed away in, in about um, 1902, 03, he moved to New York. I would pause in 1880, the sort of pedantic historian in me, and say that we have a tendency to think that like, Slavery ended, we slid into Jim Crow, and everything was the same all the time. And that's not actually the case. To say that James Reese Europe was born in 1880 in Mobile is to say that he was born in a moment of possibility um, when African Americans were feeling the, the optimism um, and, and promise that came with the end of slavery and before the, the sort of the sort of institutionalization of Jim Crow, there was a belief in possibility and in mobility um, that explains in part the move to DC where there was an emergent and actually pretty steady um, and in some ways quite fancy, y'all know, y'all know black DC, black middle class that was consolidating in this period and that would continue to remain a place of opportunity and mobility up at certainly until the Wilson administration in the 19 teens and then even after that. And in DC, um, James Reese Europe started his musical training. I think it's fascinating to think that, I think it was one of his violin teachers maybe, who was Frederick Douglass's grandson. Mm -hmm. So to think about the ways that we can connect across decades, another teacher was, um, John Philip Sousa's assistant musical director, whose name I can't recall off the top of my head, um, and also his mom, right? So you see this space of um, black folks in the arts, learning from one another and um, from one another and others in kind of places of what we traditionally think of as high culture. And because we have limited time, I'll stop talking, which is hard. For me. <laughs> well, yeah, just when you, you mentioned Woodrow Wilson, and to think, you know, that all the things that eventually happened with, with Europe when he really rose to frame was during the Wilson administration. That there were so many things going on at that time. Well, uh, James Reese Europe was not only the band leader that we all know about and the conductor and the, um, can we use the term that they used in those days? Race man was a, a phrase of that time. Well, you know, U.B. Blake the called him um, the Martin Luther King of music. So as you were saying that he was the early that actually Ellington was a late James Reese Europe. I was like, I wonder if anybody would be like, no, Martin Luther King was the James Reese Europe <laughs> of the civil rights. Well, now we, turn, now we turn to my friend Stephen, and we're going to talk just for a moment about James Reese Europe, the composer, and about how he evolved from where we left him with Adrian and, and where composition comes in. Sure. So I uh, want to say a couple of things. So James Reese Europe authored um, you know, many compositions, mainly musical theater type songs, both solo authored and then collaborations uh, with fellow musicians, people like Ford Dabney, you know, one of the uh, sheet music, one of his pieces is one of the pictures we've got rotating here. And I think it's worth kind of, we were just talking about um, race men and, and talking about kind of the project of racial uplift and the struggle for black civil rights in the early 20th century. And musical theater at that time, uh, that circle of musicians that also included people like Will Marion Cook, uh, people like Noble Sissel and U.B. Blake, 
Um, these are people who are really on kind of the cutting edge in the sense that uh, they recognize the work they were doing in musical theater as being part of this broader project of um, you know, securing a type of respect and visibility for black people, obviously that had not existed in America up to that point. Um, these are people who also are very aware of the legacy of minstrelsy, right, which had um, been kind of the dominant way of representing black people in popular culture kind of from the 1840s and then really continued in the early 20th century as well. Um, and so, and, and you know, we'll maybe get into this when we talk about uh, Dvorak and classical music in a little bit, but, um, you know, people like uh, Will Marion Cook actually, you know, started out in classical music and then kind of diverted into musical theater in part because there were opportunities for black musicians in the theater world that were not there in the classical music world, classical music world at the time. Um, and so, so anyway, the, the various musical theater compositions that he published um, were, you know, we can see them as part of that, that civil rights struggle that we're talking about. Um, and something else is interesting, I want to talk about him as, as an arranger as well for a minute, because we just listened to um, Jada just a minute ago. And, you know, something that you can hear in the recordings that he made, uh, both with Europe's Society Orchestra and then with the 369th Infantry Band, in 1919, um, he was finding ways to integrate improvisation into his arrangements, um, you know, really a lot earlier than some of his contemporaries in the theater world, right? Like, um, thinking about the way that, say, a musician like Will Marion Cook thought about black vernacular music or about jazz, um, you know, some of the, you know, some of the, the African American cultural leaders at the time actually were sort of dismissive of some of the new forms of black improvised music that were coming up because of their associations with, um, you know, we're talking about class already, so, you know, associations with the working class, associations with places like bars and, and uh, other kind of unseemly uh, places. Um, but James Reese Europe was someone who was thinking beyond some of those kind of issues of cultural hierarchy, right? Like you have classical music here and you have ragtime down here and saying this music has value and then finding ways to integrate that into more traditional ensemble writing, right? So in something like Jada that we just heard, you have mostly, you know, a, a, a written out ensemble. Um, but he's also, you know, the, the clarinet soloist who was playing at the end was almost certainly improvising, right? Um, you know, other recordings of his both in that 1913 period, which is I think when this was recorded, and then later in 1919, you have that similar kind of balance between uh, composition and improvisation. And that's something that would eventually uh, kind of, it, it laid the groundwork for uh, what would become the art of jazz arranging, right? You know, people like Jelly Roll Morton, people of course like Duke Ellington and others. Um, so James Westerup is also kind of at the start of that history as well. Well, I'll just, uh and please join in, everybody here, because I'm sure you're all, you're all thinking things. Uh, you know, I would say that I'm a big one for crossword puzzles. And, you know, the O in Du Bois is the O in Europe, uh, is the O in, in, in all those things. And his name is rarely mentioned in those contexts. And that's one of the things about this project, I think, is to kind of rescue him to see him in his totality at that time. I'll just mention just real quick, because we, we were talking about the exhibit at, at, at the Met now about the Harlem Renaissance. And it's important you know, to know that, you know, Ellington and Bessie Smith and all these folks were not a part of that world. Uh, for the most part, they, uh, it, there was Zora Neale Hurston and, uh, and Langston Hughes and maybe one or two other who liked jazz. But just to your point about how this music at that point was, was, was not part of it. Right. Yeah, and so I guess to give some more context to that, I'm glad you brought that up. So the idea that a lot of black intellectuals had, and that includes during Europe's day, which is like kind of, you know, a few years before what we think of as the Harlem Renaissance proper. He's kind of right on the cusp, right after World War I. Um, the idea was that black vernacular music, so music like, uh, especially music like the spirituals, which is you know black sacred music, but then also black folk music, was the raw material that a composer in a more um, serious right, type of music could use as the basis for a you know composing a symphony or something. So quote unquote serious. Right. I'm, I, I said serious yeah, with yeah. with verbal scare quotes, and so <laughs> so <laughs> you did. so so right. So you know there was an idea that well this this is this is valuable as the beginning of some type of 
of um, major work of art by a trained composer. Uh, and that was the view that people, for example, like Elaine Locke had, you know, the idea that the black vernacular tradition is the basis for some type of black musical achievement in the future. Now, which what? is to say it's not a black musical achievement in and of itself. Exactly, which is to say that this music does not have as much value on its own terms as it does on someone else's terms. Now, what James Reese Europe felt, you know, we can hear from his music, right, what someone like Langston Hughes also recognized was that the music had intrinsic value of its own and should be celebrated on its own terms, right? And so that, that represented a, it, actually a pretty radical aesthetic choice at the time, you know, in the, in the late teens and early 20s in particular for someone in Europe's position. He was certainly a race, what, we call, what they would have called a race leader at the time. He was one of the most prominent and, uh, and most uh, uh, politically conscious uh, black cultural figures of the time. And so for him to embrace jazz in the way he did was, a, uh, again, a very forward-thinking thing. And we have to think about it, too. Ragtime was, if jazz was here, considering ragtime was here, it was under. And this man was able to take the sound of ragtime and arrange it and compose it for a brass ensemble, which, which is something that's, that's, that's it's, it's, I mean, when you, when you say Duke Ellington, was, you know, is the second coming of James Reese Europe, you, you actually have a, a, a profound argument because when you, when you listen to like Indianola, when you listen to Jada, you hear this, you hear this trumpet, right? And you get that same trumpet sound out of Bubba Miley, 20 years later, 30 years later, right? So Duke Ellington being from DC and being a musician, when you, when you come up as a musician, you're checking out who came up after you so you can get the kind of pride from your hometown. James Reese Europe came up in the same hometown as, as Duke Ellington. So it's very important that we understand that he was checking out James Reese Europe. And just to bring a couple of threads together, one, we tend to talk about sort of black music and the kind of popularization of black music, we tend to talk about migration as post-war phenomenon, right, with the Harlem Renaissance. But what Europe is, you know, he's exceptional, he's remarkable, he's also part of larger historical contexts and processes. Earlier migrations to New York, uh, the beginning or the sort of early stage of black music production as kind of the entertainment and mass production are coming together at the same time, right? Um, but also there's a great book by Dan Gilbert, the historian Dan Gilbert on sort of, on ragtime and Europe is, features prominently in it. And he talks about Europe's attempt to create value for black mu musicians. And he breaks that into um, cultural value, right? The kind of recognition, the elevation, the legitima legitimation, but then also like actually getting them paid and getting them paid well, right? So value in both of those senses. And one of the things he says is that it's a tough needle to thread, particularly the cultural part, because part of what he's doing is appealing to white audiences who want naturalized, they want like black inherent talent that just rises out of them. Um, but he's talking about incredibly well-trained, serious musicians. And so part of what he is doing is figuring out how to let the audiences consume black music with a narrative in their head that does not necessarily reflect the, the, the people who are playing for them, right? And that's the sort of going back and forth, or sort of, both pushing against and knowing when to stop pushing against certain kinds of racial stereotypes. And I'll just add to that, you know, the fact that, we, you see these, these musicians that we're looking at, I, there was just a picture up there of a band. Uh, many times when these folks would play, uh, they were told not to bring the music because the white audiences didn't want it to think that they couldn't read. So they would play the music from memory uh, because it would somehow offend the audience uh, if they could see that the people were actually 
reading music, so it's multiple. There, you see that? That kind of picture. You are looking at, at, at musicians and things who would have been in any symphony orchestra uh, if they had chosen to be. Well, you, Stephen, you're gonna say something? Oh, no, I was gonna say something about the kind of economic empowerment piece that Adrian mentioned, but I don't wanna cut you off. No, no, go, go. Okay, well that's, I mean, you know, and, and talking about the, the monetary value piece, you know, that's, so what, what James Reese Europe was doing with the Clef Club, in addition to this is an organization that is featuring the music of black composers and they have their own uh, orchestra that performs at Carnegie Hall eventually, um, it was also like a musician's union for black musicians at a time when they were not allowed in the main New York musician's union. And the reason why this was so important was that it wasn't uncommon in the early 20th century, late 19th century, for a black musician to show up to a gig and be told that they were only going to be paid in tips. And so they wouldn't be receiving any type of base pay at all. Um, and so you have these highly trained musicians, uh, people who are, you know, able to read music at the highest level, people who are musically versatile, uh, who are then playing for um, very, very low pay. I have to interrupt well, and say, yeah. this sounds like the jazz scene today. Well, well, well let me, right, let me, right, let me, right, let me cut you off. Let me say, let me say this. Some of these musicians would go to gigs and wouldn't play. They would be asked to mop a floor or they would be asked to help out the, me like the, 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 the head chef or wait tables. So they weren't even playing their instruments in many cases. Mm -hmm. And so what the Clef Club does is say, if you want to hire black musicians, you come to the Clef Club, this is how much musicians have to be paid. This basically establishing and then being able to enforce because they were organized, um, you know, basic, you know, basic standards for these professional musicians. And, so it's and, really part of, I'm sorry, it's really part of U.S. labor history. Yeah. It's a whole other intersection at, at the same time as, as the UAW and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, before the UAW, right? Because it's still, yeah. Um, but I think we forgot to mention the Clef Club is founded by James Reese Europe, yep. right? So he sees this problem. He also sees that there's nowhere for musicians. Like, when you want to hire a musician, where do you go to find them? You go find them hanging out in a saloon waiting for a gig. You know, by the time he founds the Clef Club in what, like 1910? Yeah. Yep. Um, he's already plugged into a scene, sort of through accident and through his own savvy, where he has begun to play at house parties for the folks who are like, you know, the characters in the Julian Fellows show, The Gilded Age, right? So the Astors, the Cabots, the Vanderbilts, those sorts of folks. Um, um, the Wanam it starts with Wanamaker. And he recognizes, like, he wants to bring people along with this because one of the things that makes him a race man as opposed to an individual person who just got money in his pocket is that he's thinking about a way of extending this so that more people benefit from it. But he knows the Vanderbilts don't want to go to a saloon to hire a musician, right? They need a place. So he gets a building. He gets a telephone at a time when people don't have telephones, right? And begins to put a structure in place so that these people present as professionals, so that they're then treated as present professionals and paid as professionals. Yeah. And I was just gonna mention on West 130th Street, uh, there's still what they call NAMA, uh, the New Amsterdam Musical Association. The building is still there, the brownstone is still there, and it's part of the same movement. Right? Well, and it, what's in the name? Um, to your point, Stephen, um, James Reese Europe did not want this to be a classist organization. The name Clef Club, he borrowed from a union in Washington, D.C. called the Treble Clef Club because it was a high-class club for black people who were high-class, <laughs> right? Classist. I mean, it was some other isms happening with the Clef Club that we don't need to get into. But he didn't want folks who might not have had the kind of training a classical musician might have had to be thwarted from coming and joining the Clef Club. Come on in here. All, anybody and everybody, come on in here. We're going to help you get work. We're going to make sure they put you up. We're going to make sure you're not a porter when you work, when you arrive at the gig and have your violin in a case somewhere. And if they don't, and if that doesn't happen, you tell us and we'll make sure that you get, you know, your just dues. This is a first. This was a first. And the, the equity was still in inequity because these musicians still got paid less than the white musicians who were a part of the union. 
the Federal uh, Association for Musicians. They still got paid less. So now we're gonna move to Dvorak, to Ellington. Can I do that quick, or would, would you like to cover that quickly? Steven? Oh yeah, yeah, I can, I can talk about it quickly. Uh, so, so Dvorak is important in this story uh, because in 1893, the National Conservatory of Music is established here in New York, and Antonin Dvorak is brought in as their director. So he's a great uh, Czech, you know, bohemian, what is now the Czech Republic uh, composer who um, you know, was already very highly respected, known kind of for the, his work in romantic nationalism and music, so using kind of Czech folk music as the basis for uh, compositions. And so he comes in, and the way he plays into this story you know, during his time at the National Conservatory of Music is he says uh, in an interview that the basis for uh, an American school of composition should be African American traditional music and also Native American traditional music. And so in doing that, he gives a type of institutional uh, uh, support, right, to black composers uh, in classical music and, and also not in classical music, right, who are looking to use uh, black traditions in music as the basis for kind of uh, new innovative music of various kinds. So you do have people who write classical music uh, drawing on black folk themes. You also have people like James V. Syrup, Mil Will Marion Cook, uh, ultimately Duke Ellington as well, you know, in a later generation, who are using black folk traditions, again, as the basis for just forward-thinking music, generally speaking, and kind of outside of the classical tradition. So Dvorak is not the person who starts black people kind of like, you know, composing, but he is someone who, by, you know, in the position he was in at the National Conservatory of Music by recognizing the value of black folk music as the basis for musical development in America, he both um, kind of made a really strong case for black music as a definitive American music, right, that had value kind of on a universal level, right, and then also uh, the value of that music um, to the next generations of composers as well. And he wrote this famous symphony, we all know, from the New World. And in it, he included a movement uh, that was his version of what at that time would have been called a Negro spiritual, which is dee, 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 going home. And in it, what, what he does is he writes it from his perspective as a Czech composer. I heard this, I loved it, and I'm going to interpret it through my lens which is exactly what Ellington wound up doing with the music that he heard from around the world. He didn't try and imitate music from Japan or music from Latin America. He interpreted it in his own way. So all these threads come together. You mentioned a book. I would mention Ma Ma Maurice Perez's book, From Dvorak to Ellington, which really was the first one really to kind of to make this case. Well, I'll pick it up and take it now to the castles. And I'm looking at the audience here, and I see some folks. I don't know if I'm the only person here who knew Jean Bach very well. But Jean Bach was a wonderful woman who uh, made the film A Great Day in Harlem and uh, was a close friend of Duke Ellington's and all these folks. Her stepmother was Irene Castle. And Irene Castle, we'll see on a photo up here, because Irene and Vernon Castle were, okay, let's put it this way. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers were the second <laughs> Vernon and Irene Castle. Uh, <laughs> uh, and in the 1910s, uh, they introduced white America to a slightly changed version of a little more sexually repressed version of, of the idiomatic dancing that was happening in black communities for years and years and years. And we came up with the foxtrot, uh, and we came up with the bunny hug, and the ball and the jack, and the eagle rock, and, and all these things. There, there they are, quick, okay. There. Ca Castle lame duck waltz. You cannot believe how big they were in the years leading up to World War I. And who did they choose as their musical director? James Reese Europe. So it was an incredibly important thing. I worked a lot with Benny Goodman and Lionel Hampton. And Lionel Hampton used to say all the time that people forgot about the Benny Goodman Quartet when that was integrated, Teddy Wilson and Lionel Hampton. And they talk about Jackie Robinson and the Dodgers, 1947. They should remember that well. Uh, as much as they should remember that, 
people should talk about what happened with the Europe, with the castles and James Reese Europe. So uh, he became, this is, I believe, the first interracial thing happening in major commercial music, which means white music of that age, uh, in terms of where the economics were. So I'd like to play for you something that uh, he wrote called The Castle House Rag. Now, what you're going to hear is not the original recording, which, I, which I'm hoping that Stephen will tell us about something incredible about, but this is a recreation of it. So you can hear kind of like the instruments in a way that you can't, where it doesn't sound like, <laughs> like those old records. So here's a recreation of something he wrote for the castles. So I want to say, I want to jump in while this is still in our ears. And the reason why it's worth listening to the 1913 recording that Europe's society orchestra made, because so on the record, they play everything you just heard. That is the extent of the written score. There's like maybe 30 seconds more after that where they're, they're strictly improvising and they just kind of like have like a group jam session for maybe like a minute. And it's really, it's very cool to hear and it's very historically important because that's probably the first example on record of that type of African-American improvisation, you know. Um, and I'd say probably, you know, it's you, the thing that's interesting about it kind of from a historical perspective besides just the fact that it exists is, you know, stylistically, um, it almost sounds a little bit like a hoedown-ish, almost. You know, like it's not, it's not really what you think of as early jazz improvisation, um, but the, you know, the violinist kind of starts playing more like a fiddle player would play, and then the, uh, the cornet player, whose name was Cricket Smith, um, kind of plays like a, a simple kind of like danceable melody, and they just kind of like go along like that for maybe, you know, like a minute, and then they wrap up. So everything you heard is on the record, and then some more stuff, uh, and which is what I was talking about earlier, that mixture of, Composition and improvisation in James Reese Europe's recorded performances is something that you'd see later in the you know in records of of jazz composers and arrangers, right? So he, again, he's really on the cutting edge there. Jerome, why don't you take us to please about the famous? It's happening right at this time. I don't know how many of you know about this. We're going to find out about Carnegie Hall and Gen and James Reese Europe. Yeah. So so James Reese Europe he he makes appearances. Uh, he makes three appearances at Carnegie Hall. The first one is May 2nd, 1912. Um, this is major, this is humongous here. Um, uh, David Mains, Mans was, they were, they were tight. Y'all don't know who that is, that's the guy who started the new school. Um, but it started out as the national, uh, um, um, Conservatory, yeah. and they, they they got this idea. By this time, the Clef Club Orchestra is is making a lot of gigs um, around town, but never in a place of respectability, right? Like like a hall, it's not happening because it's a black orchestra, all black orchestra. So they get this idea. Look, let's raise some money and have this concert, but let's do it at Carnegie Hall, okay? But it was supposed to be originally the children's uh, orchestra with this, with, with, at, the, at, at the educational, you know. Uh, but they didn't get, they weren't able to put it, to pull it together. The, the, the skill level wasn't at, it wasn't up to par. So they get an idea, James Reese Europe, he has an ex extremely, he has so much confidence in his musicians. What's interesting is most of them cannot read music. To another point, uh, Stephen's point, these musicians, they're very, they're gifted, but they have, they have, they, they have, they have jobs. Some of them are porters, some of them are janitors. So they run into an issue where they not, they're not able to get consistent rehearsals. And when they do get rehearsals, everybody's not in the same room together. And when they do get rehearsals, it's in a, a horrible place that's very small, not very adequate for rehearsing. Now, they pull this concert off. It's an amazing event. Um, uh, William Cook, Will Marion Cook, he's actually, he's kind of like a hater. <laughs> 
Really, he's like, he's like, he's like, James Reese Europe is not a real, he's not a real uh, conductor. He's going to move the race back 50 years after this concert. Hating. So James Reese Europe is like, okay, I got you. There's two choirs that's going to perform, church choirs. At the 23rd hour, they're like, we're going to pull out because we don't want to look like sinners. James Reese Europe is playing popular music. This is not you know, considered high class music. Why? Because black folks are looking at, through the gaze of white folks while checking out this music. It is high class music. It's very challenging to play. Ask any piano player about how to play ragtime. They'll tell you it's tough. And it's our contribution to the world African-Americans via America. But moving on to this concert. So James Reese Europe says, Don't he, and David Mains, Mans, by the way, he's, he is the, the, the guy who's talking to the people with the money, putting this thing together. They want to raise 5,000 bucks. He's like, look, if we don't do this, if, if, if you have these subpar rehearsals, the choir's going to, they're, they're jumping out. What we need to do is cancel this we need to cancel this concert. James Reese Europe was like, nah, I got it. We got it. James Reese Europe says, if these two choirs pull out of this concert, we'll just sing. We're good. We got it. We all go to church. We can do it. <laughs> so what happened is he called James Reese Europe, put, got on the phone with the choirs and said, look, if y'all don't tell me in, in, in 24 hours that you can make, it, make this concert, you're not on the concert. So they agreed to do it. And the concert is an absolute success. It's successful. It's standing room only. It's, 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 it's split 50-50, black folks, white folks. And uh, after sitting together, that's right. And it's interesting. Um, after that concert, the Clef Club just blows up. They blow up. They get, they get called to go to Europe, to go to London. They get called to play in every possible place you can play in New York City and beyond. And it's a credit to the race. I'm quoting <laughs> um, how new people were writing in, in, in black and white newspapers. There's a, there's, a, there's a writer named, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm taking up too much. There's a writer named Lester Walton who writes for the New York Age. If not for him, I don't even think James Reese Europe would have been as successful as he was because he used to write in such a positive light about this music and about what people were hearing that they didn't even understand what they were hearing. So that's the Carnegie Hall concert, the first Carnegie Hall concert. It's very significant. And it helped put James Reese Europe on the map. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jerome. I think it's time we hear some live music. One of the pieces that, uh, well, I'll put it this way just real quickly. Um, some of you might remember a movie called The Glenn Miller Story from the 1950s with Jimmy Stewart. And it tells this story about this guy who had a successful band. And then he gave up the band. And then he went to, then he went to Europe in World War II with his band. And then he died and all this kind of stuff. Well, I have one question. Why hasn't there been a movie about James Reese Europe? Because Glenn Miller was the second James Reese Europe. Uh, and it's, it's really, okay. <laughs> okay, all right. But in any case, one of the pieces that, uh, that broke through in terms of African-American music in, the 19, in 1914, just at the time of, of the second or third James Reese Europe concert was, of course, W.C. Handy's St. Louis Blues. And we know that James Reese Europe played it, they made a recording of it, but I think we need to hear Esteban Castro take something that James Reese Europe played and bring it for us here right today. Esteban? Esteban? 
Esteban Castro. Now, let me tell you something that's so important about what just happened. The feeling you had when you're hearing that music, hearing something done right in front of you, and you don't quite know what's going to happen, and it's so much of the moment. That's how James Reese, James Reese Europe's music sounded to the people then. And sometimes it's hard to transpose it when you hear it on an old record from 100 some odd years ago, and all that kind of stuff. That is how it felt. So that feeling that you have now about having just experienced a, a, a thing through music with rhythm and with feeling and with whatever the heck it was, that's how people heard James Reese here. But I think sometimes we have to plug that into it when we talk about these historical figures because they were living life going forward. They're coming to get me. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it happened once and ever since then I can't help it. Okay, sorry. Okay, now. Is that another plant panel st story for another panel? Uh, it's one we show the jerk. <laughs> but anyway, so anyway, so... It, to get back to it, um, right around this time, I'd like just to open it up to the panel to discuss uh, Burt Williams and James Reese Europe in the same sentence as Burt Williams. Who the hell was Burt Williams? And what does he have to do with, with James Reese Europe? Everything. And then to go from there into the discussion about the Hellfighters and, and all that stuff. So why don't we start with, uh, with Adrian, if that's okay. I can do the Hellfighters. Yeah. But oh, we want some Burt Williams beforehand. Sure, of course. Um, okay. Steven, why don't you tell sure, yeah. about okay. Burt Williams? So, Burt Williams, um, you know, extremely important as a theater performer, as a comedian, you know, one of the, if not the leading kind of black figures in theater in the early 20th century. Originally, he was a partner with George Walker in the group Williams and Walker, and then becomes a star of his own right. He was featured in Ziegfeld's Follies, uh, in, I think, the 1910s or so. And um, so, you know, broke a lot of barriers at the same time, though. Um, and this is one reason why his legacy is complicated, is that he, you know, he did perform in blackface throughout his career. Now, that is, especially at the time he started, that was something that black performers were more or less expected to do, right? It was a, a rare black performer in kind of the world of popular entertainment, so theater and vaudeville and so on, who did not ever appear in blackface, frankly. Um, and so, you know, the, the thing that's amazing about Burt Williams is that um, even given the ways that his, uh, you know, like videos of him and things are, you know, kind of painfully dated because of the blackface, um, his ability as a comedian still really shines through. You know, there are a couple of uh, silent film reels of him. One that's called, I think, The Gambler or something like that. Where he's, yeah, where he's, he's kind of mimes playing a card game. And, you know, again, just the, the control over his physicality you can tell he was a master of physical humor. Also, his recordings, like nobody in particular, are still very funny, you know, so he had amazing comic timing. Um, and he and James Reese Europe actually collaborated a few different times over the course of um, their, you know, kind of they were in New York at the same time in the same scene. They were both members of this uh, group that there's a picture of circulating called the Progs, which was kind of a, uh, a, a uh, professional group of black theater performers that in some ways was kind of a parallel to the Clef Club. Um, and, um, and James Reese Europe served as musical director in a couple of the uh, productions that, star that Bert Williams starred in. Um, but, you know, something that is um, interesting, like I guess a divergence between the two of them, of course, is that uh, James Reese Europe uh, made a really definitive move away from the conventions of minstrelsy, right? That, of course, Burt Williams was very much constrained by over the course of his career. So I just want to add something to that, yeah. uh, which was that um, Burt Williams was West Indian, and he was not at all from the South, and he had none of that in his dialect, none, none, none of that in his humor. He had to learn to portray himself as a typical minstrel figure and had to learn as much as uh, anyone had to learn from somewhere else about that humor and, and the gestures and the language and all that kind of stuff. So that was actually foreign to him. And he was called the saddest man I ever saw. I think it was by W.C. Fields or Eddie mm -hmm. Cantor, somebody who was associated with him. Now here's a man who, who made the world laugh like no one else and a deep kind of laughter. I mean, it wasn't just surfacy, uh, you know, uh, and um, and yet uh, 
uh, he, he wore a mask that wasn't even his mask. Uh, it, 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 it's so common. There's a good book about him, too. It's a Romana Clef. I, I, not, I mean, it's a... Carol Phillips, Dancer in the Dark. Thank you. Yes, well, yes. We're giving you a long reading list. <laughs> I wish I was... Alex Trebek, if he was still around. <laughs> <laughs> Quiz Bowl champion in the 12th grade. Um, uh, sorry, oh, no, no, no. Sorry, I was just very quickly going to, I was just going to say that one of the things that Reese, Reese Europe and Philip share then is this, like operating, becoming stars, right? Operating in a moment when popular entertainment still trafficked deeply in racial stereotype, and not just popular entertainment, advertisements, like everything, right? And so um, pairing them reminds you that people had a tricky like as I said, sort of tricky sort of path to tread and different folks made different choices about how to deal with that. Um, and to talk about that is not to judge one person or the other for the choice they made, but to understand the complexity of the terrain. And to just, well, sorry, just the last thing I'll add on that point is that, you know, to be clear, um, you know, James Reese Europe also had to make compromises with the menstrual stereotypes that were still very much current in American, American popular culture at the time. You know, if you look at the titles of the, some of the theater songs he wrote, if you look at the plots of some of the, of some of the productions that he was involved in, either as songwriter, music director, et cetera, uh, they're, right, yeah, they're still full of the, of the conventions, right, of the tropes and the stereotypes and everything that come directly from the minstrel show. So uh, even, even someone who was able to uh, not perform in blackface um, is still kind of, having to negotiate, right, the, the legacy of minstrelsy. So that's and I'll put an asterisk here and just say Spike Lee bamboozled. Yeah. We'll talk about that <laughs> some other time. Anyway, sorry. How I learned about most deaf. I was like, who are the Mau Mau's? They may be nuts, but they're good. So to Adrian's point, uh, I'm a, you know, to extend what, what's been said, um, there, and there's always an alternative to what's happening. Um, when you think about James Reese Europe as a as a young musician and and arranger or as we would call or uh, theater music director, he came up under um, two very radical figures in a man named Bob Cole and a man named James Rosamond Johnson, who's the brother of James Weldon Johnson. His first experience, now, now I always say this, if your first experience as a new mu a, a musician in a person's band, that is your musical father, mother, parent. So you're gonna move in a certain way based off of what you've been listening to behind the stage, how do you conduct yourself as a musician. That is gonna be very apparent in James Reese Europe life moving forward to be a part of, to, be, to, to get his first major music directing job um, with, with a play called the, uh, uh, well, the second one was Red, um, what's the name of that play? Well, Shoe, Shoe Fly Regiment was the first one that he had. And the second one was Red Moon. These are plays by uh, Bob Cole. Now, just real quick, Bob Cole, he's from, he's from Georgia. Well, no, he's from Florida. He's 10 years old. He gets into a fight with a white kid. Well, he's born in 19, 1868. He gets into trouble. He gets into a fight with a white kid. They both pull out knives, and they get down, right? and he gets his finger sliced and he ends up ruining his finger for like the rest of his life. But that being said, Lynch Mob comes to the house to get him. His father is like, look, no, you, we're going to put you, we're going to hide you and you're going up to live with your auntie in, in Georgia. So he moves to Georgia. He becomes, he's a, he's a musical savant. He ends up hanging out and getting together with, with, with uh, Jay Rosamond when he moves to New York and they, they write these plays. He is a writer of what's called the Coon songs of the time. And many of them had Coon in the title. One of, one of his first successful plays was called uh, Coon Town. 
And he was writing one that was called, um, <laughs> this is messed up. He was writing one that was called uh, uh, Cooney Island. Now, 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 here's the thing. His manager was a man named Rudolph. I can't, I can't, his the last name is leaving me right now, but he was the manager for the, Cicer, for Ciceretta, uh Jones, the, the Troubadours. And he was a crook. He wanted to own all of Bob's music. And Bob was like, nah, you can't have my music. I wrote it. So he had him thrown in jail. And Bob Cole was consistently trying to uplift black folks and getting them to one own their music, get the money that they that that they should be, you know, granted for the work that they were doing on an equal basis playing with white musicians and troops. That is so forward thinking for the times to be vocal about it, not just talk about it amongst your friends. And he did that. And who is the first, who, what is the first job James Reese Europe has as music director for Shoe Fly Regiment? And Shoe Fly Regiment and, and, and Red Moon are very radical plays for the time. They show black people in love. They don't use coon in the title or word within the play. And there's not a lot of shucking and jiving in it. Now, what's interesting, this is a young James Reese Europe music directing a play that has these things going on when the Coon song is still popular. And, and, and also, just lastly, Bob Cole wrote a lot of Coon songs and made a lot of money, right? Like Tom, Tom Fletcher writes in his book, 100 Years of Black Entertainment, Black Folks, Negro in the Entertainment Business. He wrote this in 1950. It was published in 1950. He says that the songs that Bob Cole wrote were whistled and sang, sung all over the country. So Bob Cole was very famous and made a decent amount of money, but he didn't own his music. That's a different, that's different. So James Reese Europe came up under these people. And this is an alternative to Burt Williams, right? They were all friends. I mean, if you look at that picture of the frogs, James Rosamond, Bob Cole, they were a part of the Frogs, right? But I think because, I, I, I think, I think uh, uh, Burt Williams was, was bar, from Barbados, I believe. I'm not sure, but I know he was West Indian. Yes? Bahamas. Bahamas. That's right, Bahamas. Um, I don't... I don't think he was in tune to what was necessarily happening within the black community and how things were shifting. He made a lot of money. He's the first black millionaire entertainer in the United States. And look what he was doing to get that money. He wouldn't take the blackface off when he had an opportunity to take it off. When it was like passe to wear blackface, he kept wearing it. So he felt a way. I'm not judging him, but I just know he felt a way about doing what he did. All right, so why don't we transition now into the, the you can say something, Steve? No, oh, no. Into the story of the Hellfighters, and because it's a, a, a great segue, actually. I'm going to do World War I a terrible disservice by trying to do it in like a minute, because I know that we are um, a little behind. So the, um, as you may know, New York had a Black National Guard unit founded on the eve of World War I. Um, when, they when they decided to do this, when, when they started doing it, James Reese Europe, who was a superstar at this point, said, I'm going to sign up. And Noble Sissel, his friend and business partner, said, you're crazy. You're going to walk away from this? And he said, oh, no, not me. We. I signed you up, too. Um, <laughs> And so they joined the 15th New York National Guard. James Reese Europe wanted to be a soldier. He joined it. Like, he, you know, trained. He was, became a lieutenant. But he was in it to fight. Um, and then um, when, I think it was William Hayward, who was the sort of white officer who was pulling this all together, realized he had James Reese Europe. And the, he was like, you can't, we're going to be a, you, we're going to have a band. You're going to lead the band. 
And James Reese Europe was so reluctant to do it that he started making outrageous demands, assuming that that would get a note. Well, I'm going to need not 20-something people, somewhere between 44, maybe even more than 60. You're going to have to set money aside for the musicians. I know the Army doesn't do that, but you're going to have to. Really, what we're going to need is $10,000 mm. um, in 1916 or 1917. <laughs> William Hayward plugged into kind of good donor circuits in New York, says, I think I can get, what, a hundred, I can't do that, a hundred people to give 10 bucks or however the math would work out, right? That's not right. A thousand people to give 10 bucks? <laughs> um, not a math professor. Um, and so he starts with one man um, whose name I cannot remember, which is a shame, and he says, can you introduce me to, I don't know, Maybe it's a, a hundred people to give a hundred, whatever, a bunch of your friends um, as letters of introduction. And this man says to him, well, it would be a lot easier to just write you a check for $10,000 than to go s write a hundred letters and writes it off. Goes back, all of a sudden, James Reese Europe is directing a band. Um, they, you know, World War I starts, the U.S. is in it. Rayford Logan, who became a historian, was an officer in World War I, said about his World War I experience that he, taught, he fought two wars at once, his own and Woodrow Wilson's, and he wasn't sure which one did more damage to him, right? That quote for Logan about himself stands in for many, many people's experiences, including the folks of the, the 15th, who then went on, they were federalized as the 369th. They were brought over, they did horrible back-breaking labor because the army was reluctant to use even their combat troops in combat. The French, however, needed, um, men, so Pershing gave some of the black units over to the French. So the 15th fought with the French in some ways that removed them from the worst of American racism, but it also put them in on the front so that they spent more time under fire than any unit in the war. James Reese Europe was in and out of it. He was pulled out to perform with the band, and it was actually his touring with the band that sort of electrified European musicians and European audiences that contributed to the spread both of ragtime and jazz overseas. Um, and we can, I'm sure, you know, that's a story that's relevant to this, but I think it's important to note that he carried with him not just that experience and the sort of the electric excitement and the responsibility of being a musical ambassador for what he felt strongly was a truly American form of music, but then also the weight and, and the trauma, right, of, of experience of what was really the most brutal war that, you know, humans had. I mean, we could talk about the Civil War for Americans, but by and large, that anyone had experienced up until... That point. And that and that had a lot to do with the technology of it, yeah. because it was yeah. you know the first with with the, with the horses and the cavalry and then the yeah. the new machine, machine guns machine and all warfare. that they, they had just never seen anything yeah. like this before yeah and so um, and the army was hostile to black soldiers and certainly black officers so by the end of the war um, James Reese Europe was the only black officer left in his unit. Um, and as you probably know, there was a f famous, you know, sort of triumphant parade through the, the streets of Paris at the end of the war. The army excluded black troops from that parade. But when the 369th returned to New York, they marched all the way up Fifth Avenue back to Harlem with James Reese Europe and the band leading the way. And you might have seen some of that footage. That's some of the most archived footage that you see in all the documentaries about anything uh, remotely about that period is this great stuff. Uh, I just want to mention that next week, not next week, but the next program that we're doing in April uh, is going to shine light on the fact that many, that, that a significant amount of people in that orchestra were of Caribbean heritage, yeah. and people from Cuba, and people from Puerto Rico, and all this kind of stuff. And we're going to kind of shine the light on that too, so it's multi multifaceted history here that many times uh, is not acknowledged. Yeah, he actually, just to interject, he actually used some of the money he got to fund, you know, the band. He actually used it to go to Puerto Rico. To that was one of his demands. Yeah, You're going to let me go to Puerto Rico. Like, he's like, I need to go to Puerto Rico specifically to get reed players. Like, right. he went to There's get woodwind players there. Right. And so the uh, the clarinet players in the band were Puerto Rican specifically. So, it's, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. I, would, I would make the argument that, I mean, James Reese Europe, he might have been the, one of the first to, if not the first, to combine jazz and Puerto Rican 
music together. He was. He was. Yeah. He, 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 had, to, he had to be. Long before, well, Dizzy. Long before yeah. Mario Bowser, Dizzy, and... Yeah. You and, know. you know, def it's interesting, that parallel, too, because, I mean, there was definitely, obviously, in New Orleans, there was, like, kind of, like, I think, maybe, you know, Cuban influence and, and, and Caribbean influence. So there's kind of a parallel. Like, it's interesting to see the parallels there, um, because in New York, you know, not only do you have James Bruce Europe recruiting Puerto Rican musicians for his band, you also have, you know, increasing uh, immigration from the Caribbean to New York in the early 20th century, and, the you know, the musical ferment that comes out of that, you know, is also... Radical moves, Laura Putnam. Yeah. So anyway, so it's, it's a really interesting yeah. point in history. You know, if I were to digress, which I'm not, um, <laughs> you know, the actual instrumentation of what we think of as the New Orleans band, actually, there's a good case to be made. There's a scholar friend of mine who lives in Mexico to make the case that it actually came from the Danzone orchestras mm. that went from Cuba to New Orleans, that actually in New Orleans, there's no there were uh, African-American military bands and cornets and all, and all that stuff, like Sousa kind of bands, but there, there, there was no clarinet and trombone and trumpet. But I won't digress. Yeah. Now, we uh, I want to say something to the audience here just quickly, because we've gone long here. And we all know, because we do a lot of this stuff, and, and Jerome's a musician too, as am I, we can always sense when, when an audience is very actively engaged with us. And I want to thank you for sticking with us through this, because uh, are, are you enjoying yourself? Yeah. <laughs> but I just want to say, I, I sense that. Uh, I sense it, and it is very important for us here. We have, there's so much more to talk about, and we want to have some time for questions and answers. Um, I'm going to sadly cover the end of James Reese Europe's life, yeah. which is that they came back from, from Europe, and they marched up Fifth Avenue, and he had, he was a young man, and he had his whole life in front of him. You know, history's written going forward. No one knew what was going to happen. And, uh, you know, the, it was uncharted territory. What could happen to someone like that? You know, what would have happened if he hadn't died? And then how Duke Ellington would have evolved? Who knows? Uh, you know, if Thomas Edison's mother hadn't met his father, it would be dark in here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but anyway, okay, thank you. Thank you, okay. <laughs> but my point is, my point is, is that they played in Boston, and there was a percussionist, there were two percussionists in the band, and one was um, a little unbalanced, a little paranoid, and Europe was conducting and all this kind of stuff, and who knows, you know, he looked, he went like, he went like this, he, he did something, and this guy, felt that he had been humiliated and embarrassed in front of everybody. And uh, during, I, I'm not sure if it was the intermission or whether, it was, I think it was after the concert, he went back to the dressing room and James Reese Europe was in there with all these people and how wonderful. And you can just imagine what the future was at that moment in 1919. And the guy just got really annoyed. He said, you, you did this. You know, and, he, and he just went kind of, went up to him, just kind of went like, like that. Pardon me. But you know, but I mean, just kind of like, a little something, something like that. Get him out of here. So they got him out of here. Well, he had in his hand a little pen knife, and he got the jugular vein. Mm. And that was the end of James Reese Europe. Mm. Mm. Boom. Mm. Now, the amazing thing is, is that the man who killed him became the teacher of Roy Haynes, which is a whole... Herbert Wright. Henry? Herbert? Yes, that's right. Herman. Herbert. Was Herbert or Herman? H. Wright. I thought it was Herbert. <laughs> H. Wright. You got that right. Herbert. Oh. No. <laughs> We're laughing. James Reese Sherb's dead. Oh, but, no. but anyway, so, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Henry is his pops. Uh, Herbert. Oh, Herbert is the. Yeah, Herbert got him. Yeah. So, not to make light of it, it, it it's a, it's, of course, it's a tragic story. But the, the, the beautiful part of it is, if you can say, is that John Batiste and Jason Moran, and many, many others before them have been saluting the legacy of James Reese Europe in recent years with the centenary uh, in, in 2019 and many other things, but more, more importantly, Jazz Lincoln Center, excuse me, Lincoln Center at large is now paying homage to this great, great legacy. We have some music for you, and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Uh, can we, Esteban, you there?
Come on. Hello. All right. Can you play the record of Arabian Nights? We're going to listen to James Reese Europe's band that he led in Europe during the second during the First World War. And I don't know whether you want to play during it or whether you want to blend in at the at the end of it. Whatever you want to do is fine. Here we go. believe it. Esteban Castro. Esteban Castro. So you see, James Reese Europe's music is still very much alive. Thank you all very much for coming. And thank our panelists.